Um, we want to make sure that our customers can send the right message to the right people. It's not a simple platform that we built. The, the amount of capabilities that we offer to our customers is really, really vast. Um, and the expectations that customers have from us are very high as well. Um, our platform has to be extremely reliable. It has to be easy to use. Um, it has to be intuitive, like the data that they provide to it needs to be there. And it needs to have a lot of powerful features. So today, one out of every five of all mobile applications launches with OneSignal as their messaging platform. everyone, today we have with us George Deglin, who is the CEO and co-founder of OneSignal. OneSignal is a market is a market leading customer messaging and engagement solution of which offers email, mobile and web push notifications and also in-app messaging and SMS. So is that right, sir? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, how, how are you? How was your day? It has just started, I think. Yeah, my day is just getting started, but uh, but yeah, yeah, doing very well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, so first off, like, tell us about your journey on One Signal and uh, before yeah. One Signal, and how did you like come up with the idea? So I got a pretty early start um, in my career. I, I was able to get a couple internships, um, learning software development and learning about startups um, when I was about fifteen or sixteen years old. Wow. Um, yeah, so um, uh, got yeah early exposure uh, to to the technology world here, um, and then uh, I went to college. Um, so I studied computer science at UC Berkeley, uh, mm -hmm. but the entrepreneurship bug bit me really early. So while I was in school, um, I had found um, some friends that wanted to, to start a company, mm -hmm. um, and we ended up um, starting a business together. They were a little bit older than me, so they had already graduated from college. But of course, I was balancing um, classwork with uh, with this startup. Um, that startup, uh, we were able to um, find um, angel investors and then venture funding for it. Um, and once we started raising money, I I made the decision actually to um, take a leave of absence uh, from uh, my uh, my education um, and join that company as a as a co founder. Um, so that, that leave of absence um, has now uh, gone on for, for many years. I, I never got a chance to return. Um, after that company um, uh, started to grow, um, and I started a, uh, we got to a point where, where I started to look at some new opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up starting a company. I met a, my, my co-founder of OneSignal, um, and we started a company that was initially a mobile game studio. Mm -hmm. um, and then in about 2015, um, we pivoted the company into, uh, into what we built today, which is OneSignal. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, we, we're fortunate now to work with many other startups, um, mm -hmm. including uh, many game studios in particular. That's been a really good category for us. So a lot of the experiences and lessons that we've learned along the way have, have shaped what we built today. Wow, that's actually really inspiring. Thank you for sharing that, first of all. <laughs> So, uh, so how, what exactly does one signal do? Like for somebody who is not from a technical background, how would you say yeah. that it helps with in-app notifications and what exactly are push mm -hmm. notifications? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, one signal is in a category that's emerging. Um, the category is called um, customer engagement platforms. Okay. Um, and when you think about uh, the name of that, it means it's a product that helps you increase the engagement rate of your, it helps businesses increase the engagement rate of their customers. Okay. And how do we think about it, engagement? Engagement is things like, is the person coming back to use, um, you know, coming back to my business or coming back to the mobile apps that I build? Mm -hmm. Are they um, having a good enough experience that they're compelled to buy things or to engage more deeply with the company? Mm -hmm. And so when we think about what we do, it's all about how do we help our customers drive higher engagement, um, higher retention, mm -hmm. um, and higher revenue from the customers that they already have. Um, and what we found, um, and this finding came from our personal experiences when we were building games, is 
in the modern technology world, engagement doesn't just happen when you're in a store or when you're using an app. It also happens when you're not. It happens when you're checking your email or happens when you're looking at your phone and seeing the messages that you've gotten from different apps. Right. And so recognizing this, that engagement is now something that happens continuously um, mm-hmm. in our day and is connected to the businesses that, that we um, interact with um, mm-hmm. is, is you know, where the vision for our product really comes from. So how does that boil down to the product? Um, mm-hmm. Our customers uh, use our product to send messages to their users. Um, okay. And those messages can come in the form of a email. Um, mm-hmm. They can come in the form of a text message. Mm-hmm. They can come in the form of a mobile push notification. So if you mm-hmm. ever, you know, you think about the messages you might get from like food delivery applications or social networks, we mm-hmm. help um, them, our customers send very effective notifications. And then finally, one of the channels we support is called in-app messaging, which is mm-hmm. a message that you could receive during the experience of you using an application. So that might be like a pop-up to advertise um, a new product um, or a pop-up that um, uh, allows you to invite other friends to join you in the application. We help make those really easy as well. Right. So because a person has a phone in their hands like all the time, so you yeah. are you would want the customers to be engaged on their on their phones on that particular app the max amount of time okay, yeah so exactly that's... it's a yeah a perfect example when i woke up this morning um you know the first thing i do i think the first thing we all do is we look at our phones like yeah. w- what messages have we received mm-hmm. um and you know maybe i see a message that's from a ride sharing app that says um you know get ten dollars off your ride today mm-hmm. um now it's like, oh, that's great. Um, you know, maybe I'll go check that out. Um, or I'm, I really like Starbucks, and Starbucks has all these promotions. Um, and so, you know, sometimes in the morning they'll send me a message that'll say, "Hey, this drink is half off today." It's like, <laughs> okay, well, you know, I don't want to drink Starbucks too often. I know it's not, it's not the best for me, but maybe once or twice a week. Um, and mm-hmm. if on a certain day they've offered me a discount, I'm much more likely to to go and get coffee there. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. So uh, when you're creating such a service, it is obvious that it comes with certain challenges. So if in case, for example, if a company or a mobile app company does not have proper push notifications, what challenges do you think that firstly, what challenges would the company face? Mm-hmm. So yeah. Start- so- yeah, there's a couple of challenges that kind of are inherent, and there's some that we, we work to solve for our customers. Mm-hmm. One of the challenges is that um, implementing all of these messaging channels into mm-hmm. your app is a lot of work. Um, you know, it used to yeah. be that if you had an online business, um, you would probably need to send emails to your users, and that was it. Email was the kind of the only channel you need to think about. Mm-hmm. Email can be complicated in of itself, but it's just one. But mm-hmm. today, a modern consumer company, they need to think about email, they need to think about push notifications, they might be sending SMS, and they have different messages that appear in the application as well. Mm -hmm. So now you've got one to four channels. That's a lot to think about. And not only that, but the channels need to um, work in concert with each other, Mm -hmm. right? So um, if you receive um, a promotion via uh, a push notification, you don't want to receive another promotion in, in an email. That'd be very confusing. Yeah, um, right. You might want the same promotion to come on both channels. Mm-hmm. So having um, a system that can help you centralize those messages in one place mm-hmm. and to help the business owner or their team um, orchestrate the right experience across those mm-hmm. channels um, is something that uh, our product is that's that, that's the, the problem that our product really goes a long way to solve for our customers. So hence, I suppose, the name One Signal. So it's yes. sort of like one signal for all platforms and all kinds of problems and notifications and SMS and emails, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's one platform that helps you bring all your messages together mm-hmm. to make it easy to implement them, but also to make it so that the channels work really well um, in concert with each other. Okay, so... Uh... So I'm just imagining. So, for example, if I have an app and I have certain specific needs and I have certain preferences. So is there some level of personalization also in the 
push notifications that I would receive personally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so in addition to, of course, helping you send messages, um, we want to make sure that our customers can send the right message to the right people. Mm. The message you might mm. receive as someone who just downloaded an application might be very, very different from someone who's been using it every day for, for months and months. Mm -hmm. And so the way that we do that is we enable our customers to bring their customer data into our system. Um, and one of the things we've focused on is making that very, very easy for them. So whether their customer data lives in the app itself or whether it lives in their database somewhere, um, we've got many ways that they can bring that data into our platform um, in either a manual process or even better if it's in an automated process. Mm -hmm. And once that data is there, uh, they can see it and they can start to create segments of their users. Mm -hmm. So they can create a segment that says, okay, these are users who installed my app today. Um, and these are users who maybe installed my app, but haven't used it in a while. Mm -hmm. And then they can set up different messages to those different groups because mm -hmm. different, you know, different types of messages will resonate differently with different audiences. But the step beyond that, of course, we've talked about the data and creating segments. Um, the, the best way to start to use this is not to have a manual process, but to create an automatic process where this occurs. So mm -hmm. where you can automatically have a sequence of messages that goes out to users when they download an application, or mm -hmm. automatically have a message that goes out to users who maybe haven't opened the application in a while. Um, and so we've got a product called Journeys, um, which um, you know, the name kind of maps to, to what it helps you do is it helps you create these automatic customer journeys, different messages that people will receive based on um, the information that the customer has provided us about them. Okay, so that's interesting. So basically, journeys helps you uh, resolve the problems that you basically face on one signal while you are helping others resolve their problems. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So, uh, also, um, what level of personalization is available? So, for example, and since I think personalization could be extremely dynamic also based on the location. Oh, yeah. And so, one is that uh, based on the time timeline on when the app was downloaded, but again, then preferences are there. And then what level of personalization is available and you help yep. uh, your clients with? Yeah, um, the depth of personalization can can really be unlimited. Um, at the most basic, um, certainly uh, localization is a core part of our platform. Okay. Um, I think one of the ways that businesses are different today than they were maybe ten years ago is every like almost every mobile app has some type of global presence, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, our customers are always thinking about how do we make sure that. Um, our messages are going out in the right language, um, mm -hmm. and that's built into our platform. Mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with language and um, global reach, time zones mm -hmm. become uh, a consideration. Um, right. And so, yep, yeah. So we automatically detect what time zone um, each message recipient is in. And so when our customers go to send a message, they can schedule it to be delivered at a consistent time across every time zone, and we'll automatically um, deliver the messages at the right time. Um, and then you get into the, the personalization of the message content itself. Um, uh, and we support um, what's called liquid templating. Um, okay. It's almost like a programming language that you can put inside of the message content where you can customize the content based on data that you've provided about the user. Um, okay. So. For example, um, uh, you might uh, have a list of products, uh, maybe five different products that you want to promote, but you want to promote them based on preferences that that person has provided, like maybe their age or gender or location. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually create just one message, but instead of putting in that one product, you can use liquid templating and you can basically write code that says if this person likes this type of product, or if they're in this age range, then show them uh, this item. If they're in this other group, show them this other item. Um, and so it's really cool because 
you know, bef- without this, you would have to create, you know, five or 10 or 20 different messages or more. But in this case, you just create, create the message once, but the message can adapt to the recipient. Wow. So I'm just wondering, like, that would be a really big code, right? <laughs> because um, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Liquid templating is a more advanced feature. Um, it's not something that all our customers use because it does require um, a little bit of uh, technical familiarity or um, if you're not familiar with liquid templating, you have to learn it. It's not terribly difficult. Um, and you have to have a business that's at a level of sophistication where that you're able to, to do that level of personalization. Um, but of course, um, uh, you know, one of the things about OneSignal is we work with a very, very broad set of customers all the way mm-hmm. from you know, people that are building apps um, uh, on nights and weekends to Mm -hmm. huge enterprises. Um, And we do find that some of our bigger customers really value um, the more powerful personalization features that are available. Okay. And so what are the major challenges that you face when you build this? Because so from what I've understood is that there's a huge landscape that needs to be taken care of. There are huge, there's a huge demand and there's huge customization. And there are different mm-hmm. kinds of apps. So this might come mm-hmm. with a lot of challenges, right? So what are the major challenges that you face? Yeah, so that we face as, as a business, is that the question? Mm-hmm. Yes, is, that's the question. Um, yeah, yeah, gosh, a, a multitude of them. Um, so... There's a couple of things that are just inherent challenges um, for any business in the customer engagement space. Um, one of those is, um, as you have probably gathered from the conversation so far, it's not a simple platform that we've built. The, the amount of capabilities that we offer to our customers is really, really vast. Um, mm-hmm. And the expectations that customers have from us are very high as well. Um, mm-hmm. Our platform has to be extremely reliable. It has to be easy to use. Uh, it has to be intuitive, like the data that they provide to it needs to be there. And it needs to have a lot of powerful features um, because if we didn't support localization um, or time zone targeting or liquid templating or all of these things, um, it just wouldn't meet our cust- what the custom- our customers need. Um, so we've got a, a very talented um, engineering team. Um, my own background is as a software engineer. Um, Mm -hmm. which I think has contributed to the quality of our platform. Um, And when we think about even sort of the size of our team, um, in contrast to other software companies, we have a much larger product and engineering team than most other software companies at our stage. Um, There's also a challenge that's unique to the way that we've approached um, building a product in this category, which is that we've chosen to build a product that anybody could use. Um, We have a free version of the product that's really powerful, um, mm-hmm. And we have um, uh, different plans all the way up to an enterprise version um, that has a lot of sophisticated capabilities for our enterprise customers. Um, okay. As a result of this model, um, you know, it's created challenges around the product has to be easy to use mm-hmm. because if we were only selling it to enterprises, it might be okay that it's, it would be complicated. But when we also sell it to people that can just sign up with a credit card or use the free version, they need to be able to have a very um, easy experience all on their own. Right. Um, it also means the scale that we're at is enormous. So today, one out of every five of all mobile applications launches with OneSignal as their messaging platform. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's it's a pretty <laughs> crazy number. We're up to we're approaching two million uh, people that have created OneSignal accounts to use us in their. Um, mobile application or website. Um, Mm -hmm. And we're sending um, uh, over 12 billion messages per day. 12 billion messages per day. 12 billion messages per day, yeah. yeah. Um, So, (laughs) yeah, you can can imagine that it's, um, you know, it's, it's, the scale is is quite enormous. Um, We're not, any of our individual customers can be big on their own. We have customers Mm -hmm. with hundreds of millions of users. Um, and you know, even if we were building a platform just for that, it would be a little challenging, um, but we're building a platform for literally hundreds of thousands of businesses, many of which have millions or tens of millions of people that are using their, their, um, applications and receiving messages from them. Um, and we manage all of that for them. Oh, that's, that, that really sounds like a lot of work (laughs) from what I know. (laughs) It's not easy. 
Um, but it, it's also, um, you know, I think the way you build a great business is you find something that you're uniquely good at. Um, yeah. And we're uniquely good at supporting this enormous scale um, and the technology required to, to make it all possible. Mm -hmm. So coming to the technology, do you think uh, artificial intelligence plays a huge role in the development of such and be supporting like this huge organization? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a couple places where we've already incorporated artificial intelligence into our product. Um, and where we see it being the most useful is in areas where customers have a difficult time um, uh, making decisions um, on their own, just places in the product where it, things are a little bit less intuitive. Um, so for example, um, one of the places we use um, artificial intelligence is to determine the best time of day to send notifications to different people. Um, and that's a hard thing for someone just to intuitively know. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's actually been a really great place for us to provide um, an algorithmic solution um, that helps our customers just check a box and know that we'll optimize uh, when people receive their messages. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also been looking at artificial intelligence for some other use cases, including um, helping our customers create the right segments of their users. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be included, you'll see more features launch from us um, in that realm. Um, okay. One of the places where um, we've shied away from it a little bit more is, um, you know, sometimes there are things where um, uh, like tasks that humans are really, really good at um, <laughs> and AI is really, really good at it. In those cases, we've said, you know, our experience has been that when people use a product and there's something like writing a message that marketers, mm -hmm. for instance, take a lot of pride in, we want to give, you know, we don't want to try to replace them with AI. That's probably not going to be um, like a very popular feature, mm -hmm. but where we can help them do it even better, uh, that's mm -hmm. certainly useful. Um, and then the last point I'll add is, um, you know, I think a lot of businesses have jumped into AI because it's like a really hot, interesting yeah. thing. Um, and we've taken a more practical approach. We look at, okay, where is this going to be very, very useful to our customers? But at the same time, we haven't like stopped the rest of our roadmap. We recognize there's also a lot of non-AI capabilities that our customers mm -hmm. really need from us. Um, and we have to make sure we're focused on those as well. So what I understand is like when you have a choice between AI and human eye intelligence, you would rather prefer human intelligence over AI. Well, it's places where humans are already very, very good. Right. Um, I think the best place to put AI into a product like ours is tasks that are super difficult for humans. Mm. Um, and that's true for a lot of products. Um, I think AI is the most compelling when it enables you to do something you were never able to do before, where it was very difficult to do on your own. Mm. Um, where it's a little bit less compelling is in tasks where, you know, people uh, don't mind doing it. It's easy already. Um, in those cases, maybe AI is a nice to have, but it's not a need to have. Got it. Okay, that's interesting. So, so I think we've discussed the technicalities of how you function in your organization. But like uh, one thing that you specified is that one signal has actually seen a, a rapid growth and you have a huge customer base. So what I would say is that you're on the top of the game. So how do you maintain that? How does one signal stay on the top of the game? Yeah, certainly. Um, so um, as you have probably gathered from, from um, the conversation on, on how we approach uh, the market share and, and scale that we have, we're a mm -hmm. very, very product centric business. Um, mm -hmm. We believe that in this category, the company that's going to win uh, in the long term is the one that has the best product, the product that both helps customers achieve the results and engagement that they are, that they need from it, mm -hmm. but also a product that's just very intuitive and easy to use. Okay. Um, and that's not always true when you think about um, uh, B2B software or enterprise software. It's... Um, a lot of it is pretty clunky and it's it's not intuitive, it's difficult, um, it requires training, all of these things. Um, and we're the polar opposite. Our platform is designed to just be um, like very intuitive. Everything works like you expect it to. Setting it up um, is very easy. Um, in fact, we measure how long it takes for the average 
uh, new user to set up the platform, and it's under half an hour. Um, so everything is just designed to, to work as seamlessly as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we call ourselves some, we're, um, we're what's called a product-led growth company. Um, mm -hmm. So because we have this freemium and self-serve motion, um, we don't like go out and like try to convince every individual person to go and try the product one at a time. It's okay. about building the brand and building a product that is so good that people can't help but talk about it and recommend it to their friends. Um, and so that, that energy around um, the product experience um, helps drive a lot of our adoption, market awareness. Um, and then, of course, it drives the, the financial elements for business as well. It drives um, uh, our revenue. So basically, a product that sells itself. That's your strategy. Yeah, that's a big part of it. I would say that's the only part. Um, obviously, we do have marketing and all of that. Um, but I do think that having a product that is so good that it uh, it sells itself for the most part, yeah, that mm -hmm. goes a long way toward our success. So, of course, like most of the times, it, it probably sells itself. But like there could be certain specific marketing strategies that you adapt to or you choose to adapt, which yeah. also give you the upper edge in the market. Yeah, yeah, so what definitely. Are the strategies so a lot of these strategies actually tie into um, the product-led growth motion and the quality of our product um, and what i mean by that because we have this product-led growth motion uh, and this freemium model that give us this enormous user base it means mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that talk about us they talk about us on twitter um, mm -hmm. they talk about us on reddit they talk about us um, you know, they write blog posts or they, they create open source projects that um, complement OneSignal. Um, all of this leads to really, really great search presence for us. Um, so a big thing that we do is we say, hey, even with minimal effort, our search presence is excellent. Um, let's invest in search engine optimization to make that even better. Um, and that's been highly effective for us. Okay. Uh, because we have such a large community, um, mm -hmm. We do a lot around our community efforts. How can we take the people that love OneSignal today um, and who like to evangelize it, and how do we support them? How do we bring them together in a group? How do we get them involved in sharing product feedback um, or trying early versions of new features um, so that they will become even bigger fans of the company and, and share it with um, even more people out there? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, we do a lot of partnerships. Um, and partnerships are very effective for us because basically any company you look at um, that's in an adjacent space, we have a lot of customer overlap with them, pretty much guaranteed, just because we're so big. Um, and so um, we can go to a lot of companies that, um, you know, we've, other services that we find our customers use, and we can do things with them. We can co-host events, um, mm -hmm. or we can build product integrations. Um, or we can just exchange um, advice and tips or even introduce customers to each other. Um, and all of that has, has worked really well for us. So would you say that if you find a competition, you would rather collaborate than compete? Well, with direct competitors, not necessarily. I mean, we, we do okay. compete with some of the other companies in the space. Um, mm -hmm. But there are often complementary products. Um, and what's an example of that? Um, we, um, a lot of our customers also use Mixpanel or they use Amplitude. Or analytics, um, so that doesn't compete with us. It's actually it's a it's um, a, you know it just so happens that our our customers are often their customers as well, um, okay. and so that's a great partner for us because um, we share customers and we can work together to make those customers successful, um, or oh. we can introduce customers to each other. Okay, that's that's really interesting. So, uh, what would you say is the future of mobile marketing? So where from the perspective of one signal since you've been handling push, push notifications and email marketing since such a long time and you have sort of like mastered it so what would you say is the future of mobile marketing yeah well one of the big um, industry transformations that's happening today is um, it used to be that marketers um, and mobile marketers in particular uh, were very very focused or and sometimes solely focused on um, growth through advertising, um, mm -hmm. as well as monetization through advertising in many cases as well. Um, mm -hmm. And today, that that's actually rapidly shifting. There's been a lot of changes from both a regulatory standpoint, 
um, and even more importantly, from a technology standpoint, that have made advertising less effective um, for user acquisition and user retention and for monetization. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's shifted what marketers are having to think about away from how do we just get more users into the top of the funnel into how do we um, maximize the engagement um, and experience of the users that we do have. Mm -hmm. um, and also, as advertising becomes less effective, that means that the cost of acquiring a user gets more costly. And so marketers are starting to think about not just how do we get more people in, but how do we also um, get more revenue from each person that we bring into our product. Um, okay. So that's... Um, this is a trend that honestly we didn't foresee when we started one signal um mm -hmm. but it's one that's um been uh, very like we've been very very lucky to be able to be in the market that we're in when this transformation is happening okay. because yes marketers now are thinking about okay in order to maximize uh, revenue from users i have to make sure i'm keeping them engaged i have to make sure i'm sending them messages that um you know are offering them promotions or telling them about experiences that they should come and have with the application. Um, so yeah, certainly a lot of, a lot of focus is now towards, um, you know, uh, how they can better utilize products like ours. Right. Okay. So like, I'm just wondering, like if I see an app that has really interesting notifications, push, push notifications, I would definitely want to download the app or tell my friends about it. So that's basically yeah. creating an experience is something that users would desire more in the future is what you're trying to say also. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things um, putting, uh, when you sort of look at the industry, um, mm -hmm. every company can only do so many things. Um, right. And what we saw was a lot of, you know, if you, if you go back five years ago or seven, eight years ago, you saw a lot of apps where the app experience was, it was okay. It just wasn't, it wasn't amazing. Right. Um, now the ads that bring you into the app might be really compelling. You know, the advertise, you know, might be very targeted. It might say, Hey, you should use the app. Um, might be very personalized to you. Um, but when you get to the app, it's like, ah, it's, it didn't always deliver on expectations. Mm -hmm. And that might've been a sound business strategy at the moment because advertising was relatively inexpensive and it was effective. Mm -hmm. Whereas building a great app, that's hard. Um, and so understandably, um, businesses prioritized getting mm -hmm. people in over ensuring that the experience was as good as it could be. Um, and that's okay. now shifted. Now, advertising is really hard, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so where our business is going to focus, it's going to be on making sure that the app experience is really amazing. Um, and, you know, fortunately, they don't have to do it alone. They have products like ours that have made it a lot easier for them to build great experiences. And they have other complementary products. They have um, tools for analytics um, and all these tools that help you build an app more easily. So there's a lot of great technology that has helped shift the balance over to better customer experiences, um, including email, including push notifications, and everything else that that is a core part of how we use apps. So one thing I, I suppose that uh, we can take away and all the uh, other apps can take away from your thoughts is that building apps that basically, or most of the times they sell themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, what other piece of advice would you have for like budding entrepreneurs who are maybe aspiring to build an app or, or something mm -hmm. of uh, maybe just something, they would just want to invent something. So any budding yeah. entrepreneur, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, I think one piece of advice that's really resonated with me over the years um, mm -hmm. is to pick an ambitious path. Um, if, you're, if your plan is to start a business um, or to enter a, a new category with your business, um, it seems counterintuitive, but it turns out that the hardest, most ambitious and audacious ideas are not actually all that much harder than the ones that seem like easy, less audacious ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's many reasons for that. One of the reasons is the easiest ideas often actually tend to have a lot of competition um, or it's been, it's been done many times around. And the other is that even separating yourself from the idea, the journey of building a company can be so challenging that mm -hmm. um, it almost doesn't even matter whether you're working on something 
easy or something hard. Um, mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of the same things. So you might as well pick something that's hard, um, that's going to really challenge you, but that ultimately might result in a much higher, um, much larger success if it works than picking something that, that feels like it's just going to be an easy one. So basically choose a road that's less traveled. Choose a road less traveled, even if that road um, seems much, much more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, a beautiful conversation, George. I had a lot of fun. So, and that was also really insightful. I think I would use a lot of your, a lot of the things uh, that you've said, and I would actually implement them in my own life. No, glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. I had a wonderful experience. And uh, yeah. it, yes, so it was basically an honor to actually host this interview. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so glad I could participate. Thank you so much. <laughs>